before we get into the album uh, Catalyst, I'd like to ask you a, a couple of Catalyst questions about you personally. So so let's start with, with the beginning. What was the Catalyst for you to pick up a guitar and, and pursue that route? Uh, I love the connection with the Catalyst, by the way. But um, for me, it was definitely hearing Metallica for the, for the first time. Okay. It didn't immediately make me pick up the guitar because I was kind of a little bit too small. Because okay. I heard uh, Metallica the first time when my uh, my dad and my sister were listening to um, Master of Puppets. This was before uh, Injustice for All was even out. So this would have been in probably 87, something like that, okay. at least out in Sweden. So uh, I heard uh, this song, Battery. And uh, at that point, I was playing some piano, a little bit of violin. So the, that's kind of how I started to play music. And I was nagging on my parents to for them to get me a guitar for a long time, like let's say three, four years. When I was 10 years old, nine years old, maybe I finally got an acoustic guitar. And one or two years later, my mom bought me an electric guitar. What was it about Metallica and that type of heavy music that attracted you? It was uh, definitely the the energy and also... I have to say now that I can, I, because I can still remember the first moment that I heard the battery okay. and what my young brain uh, thought that they were singing was bombs away instead of battery, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this juvenile mind thing. But <laughs> I figured already back then that it was, uh, it was really catchy music because that's not something that we mention a lot when it comes to bands like Metallica or Iron Maiden or whatever, but it, it is immensely catchy music, and that's kind of at the end of the day what brings in people to it. That and the uh, the pure power and the the speed and the aggression. It's really something that if it hits you in the right way, it's really exhilarating. And especially if, um, like me, I felt like it was something that I discovered myself also because I was sitting there with the cassette deck, listening to it. My dad already had had the album, but he wasn't really playing it out in the speaker, so it felt like my little uh, discovery, basically. Mm. And what I find interesting, those words that you use to describe the, that music, energetic, but also catchy, it's, it's very apt to Amaranth, I think, as well. So has that always been a goal is maybe too contrived, but has that always been in the back of your mind as you uh, started writing and up to now that it, there has to be some catchiness to it? It has to be uh, yeah, easy to the ears, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it can be a little bit of both because it doesn't have to always be super direct. It doesn't have to be exactly in, um, let's say, a chorus. And it doesn't have to be, you know, short and sweet and simple songs. It could also, you know, um, catchy. You could also say that about a Beethoven symphony, like uh, number Mm -hmm. nine, when it hits the great melody in the end, and it takes probably about 53 minutes to get there. So, And it's very powerful. So it still has these things, but... You could say it like this. I've always been a sucker for melodies and uh, mm. standout parts because there is a lot of great music being made that never gets to a big melody. It never gets to a big chorus. And that's always been good to me. But uh, now that you mention it, I haven't really thought about it. But I think even with the very first songs that I wrote for my first band when I was 13 or 14 years old, I think it already had you know, the very beginnings of Amaranth in there as well. Mm. And we've talked about Metallica, but there has some a band like the Beatles been an influence as well? Because obviously, because of their melodies, or have, have maybe some some band that that we wouldn't necessarily associate with metal has has that been a big influence on you as well? I would say, unfortunately, never the Beatles. Actually, I've always had a little bit of a, and I can get crucified for this. <laughs> and I ended up in discussions with people, and I totally respect the Beatles, you know, and what they did, and I can tell that they are great songwriters, but. It's never really been my cup of tea. I say exactly as you drink your tea. (laughs) And um, so for me, it was more about um, like, first of all, there was rock music like Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. But at the same time, I was also growing up with a lot of Swedish pop music like ABBA, of course. And uh, also later on, Roxette. And there would have been, you know, Ace of Bass in the 90s and also E-Type, you know, that kind of Swedish uh, dance music. And uh, like I loved everything that Max Martin was doing, you know, writing music for Britney Spears and um, you know Backstreet Boys and stuff like that. I mean, it's sure. um, Max Martin is, is from a heavy metal band. Not a lot of people uh, knows this, but he had a heavy metal band in the the nineties. 
And that was kind of his, you know, thing. And when he couldn't make it as a heavy metal songwriter, then he went into pop instead. So, okay. so that's also been 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 an influence. Like as a Swedish person, you used to constantly get bombarded by these kind of Swedish notions of what melodies should be. So I guess that's in my DNA also. But that's interesting when it comes to songwriting, then, because have you ever? Uh... Well, so, sometimes the the metal scene can be somewhat close minded, or uh, they, they it can be thought uh, in, or they think a lot in boxes in in certain uh, specific genres and subgenres within metal. But you, as a ba- as a uh, person and as a band, have always seemed very open to all kinds of influences and not uh, didn't seem afraid to express those and incorporate those in into the music. Is that fair to say? And has has there at any time been any hesitation? I mean, this is something that it, even in my first like real band that released albums called uh, Dragonland, we did this already quite a bit, you know, on our third album in 2004, we took a step from being like a standard power metal band to already incorporating a lot of influences. And it was something that I really wanted to do. It was something that came very naturally to me. And as you mentioned, the metal scene can be on the conservative side somewhat. So I thought, I mean, when we were putting this band together, Amaranth, then I thought it was fun to uh, kind of provoke those notions a little bit mm. and kind of uh, push and pull and, you know, see where the limit goes. And when we released the first single, which was Hunger, you know, 13, almost years ago, then, uh, you know, there was a lot of people who were very upset. They thought that, okay, a band like Amaranth now exists and it's as essentially single-handedly destroyed heavy metal overnight <laughs> by releasing this song. And it got even worse when we released Amaranthi, like ballad song, a couple of months later. But um, I think it was the kind of some of the reactions that I was predicting. Mm-hmm. And it was even to some extent, some of the reactions that I was hoping for, like, let's right. push people a little bit. Let's uh, challenge their notions of where the borders of heavy metal are. Because heavy metal has always been pop inspired. It's always, almost always had acoustic guitars and influences from, you know, all kinds of stuff like 70s uh, disco, you know, sure. in the 70s. So, um, but it's it's more as of late, I would say in the last 15 years that it's grown a little bit more, instead of conservative, I would say protective. And I totally understand that because a lot of people make, you know, uh, heavy metal their identity, just like I have done that myself as well, you know, especially as a musician. So I understand that people want to defend what they feel is rightfully theirs. So I do understand the notion, but I think it's good for everyone to be challenged once in a while. But that's a very inter- interesting conversation that goes into the nature of art, I think, because uh, obviously art can be consumed for, for many reasons. And there's uh, there's no one way is not better than the other, but it can be entertaining, uh, entertainment, it can be escapism, it can be... Uh, well, a catalyst for change in some cases, uh, for instance, in the 60s. But um, wh- what do you see as as the nature of, of your art? And then, what is your intention with what you do? As you mentioned, you like to poke people a little bit, uh, make them think. What is it yeah. that you want to, what, you, what do you want to accomplish with your art? I mean, besides that, it's, um, I always found it a magnificent thing, like the way that people come together around bands. It's one thing for the shows, but the fans also gather around a certain album, a certain sure. band in general, you know, a certain song, whatever. And um, there is a lot of, um, how should I say, rather dark and depressive, you know, uh, lyrics and thematic uh, matter in the heavy metal scene. And of course, it lends itself to the music because the music is inherently dark. And I think, you know, maybe our main mission with Amaranth is that we want the music to be uplifting. We deal with some, uh, you know, negative topics. We deal with some dark and depressive things, but we always try to see, you know, a positive flip side to it in order to uh, like lift people up and empower people. Because obviously, it can be very uplifting to listen to really depressive lyrics because you feel like you're not alone with it. But if you're only subjected to that, it can get a little bleak at times. Sure. So I, I think it's. Um, Amaranth at a heavy metal festival, for example, is always this little sparkly moment where, you know, it turns from whatever dark and depressive (laughs) Finnish band you had right before. And then, you know, we explode on stage with silver jackets and Elise is dancing, you know, and everybody's having a good time. And, you know, it seems like the heavy metal world has embraced it. Like when we played Wacken last year, there was 50,000 people who were 
they did not leave even if they're kind of on the old school side they uh, they appreciate it now because they understand where we're coming from they understand the purpose which is at the end of the day to lift people up and to entertain mm. one last question before we delve into catalyst but um from the outside looking in, it, it seems like with every album and every uh, product, project and tour that you've done, you've kind of incrementally gotten bigger, uh, got more people to listen to you and kind of grown. How do you personally see the evolution of the band over the past, let's say, 10 years? It's a little bit of a grandiose question, but how do you see kind of where you started and, and wh where you ended up now or where you are now? I think exactly like I say, it's always been in, I won't say small increments, but it's definitely been in increments. So there's always been like the step. And when you're right in the middle of it, it can be, it can be difficult to notice. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways we, we have even knock on wood, we have been a little bit spoiled because it's so far uh, in the 13 years that we've existed on the albums, it's always gone, you know, up in these uh, steps. So um, if, if I take, a step back which actually unfortunately happens very rarely but it did happen in covid for example that you take a step back right you take a break from the whole thing you kind of um you kind of analyze like where have you gone creatively and also to a certain extent career-wise because if your career is going in the, the right direction it means that you can do better creative things you can do cooler videos you can do better live sets uh, you know you can hire better crew to make it more relaxed to be on tour so in terms of the incremental success, I really love where we have ended up now because we are much closer to our you know, end goal vision, even mm. if you will never truly get there. We are much closer to that vision that we had initially than what we were able to do early on. Right. So for us, it's um, the few times that we, we do take a step away and kind of analyze the whole thing. It's, it is really exciting for us. But it happens maybe a little bit less often than would probably be healthy because it's good to remind yourself that you're you're doing something right if for nobody else than you know for your own sake basically sure so but it sounds like uh, once you took stock of of yourself and the band and where it was going it was very positive so w with what kind of energy did the band start on catalyst w what kind of ambition was there for catalyst I mean, it was interesting because um, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. We had released uh, the last album, Manifest, uh, at the tail end of 2020. We continued to do some promotion maybe into uh, November, but then we told ourselves, like, as we are now going into Christmas, New Year's, holiday season, let's right after that, let's not do anything. Let's take a you know few months off and do whatever COVID things that we want to do. And uh, we said to each other, let's take as much time off as possible and like mm -hmm. really rest because we had been touring like crazy, you know, the first decade, sure. nonstop uh, touring, nonstop album making, you know, that kind of thing. So I think um, I think only a couple of months later, then you start to look at your computer and you start to look at the guitar and the keyboard and you're like, I bet I could. I don't need to write music, but I could kind of test out and conceptualize, you know, mm -hmm. where we could potentially be heading, you know, with the next record. And Elise did the, the same thing around the same time, like recording um, voice uh, messages with vocal lines and stuff like that. So I think the conceptual phase for the Catalyst lasted a lot longer than it did on any of the previous albums, just because we had the time mm -hmm. uh, during COVID. And what we were kind of practically telling each other with the first ideas that we had is that let's have a little bit less boundaries. Let's keep a little bit of a more open mind and let's, let's see, you know, how far we can push this while still, you know, retaining it as Amaranth. What song was the most out of your personal comfort? So which song did you feel like those boundaries were, were stretched the most? I would say a song that was both very much in my comfort zone and very much outside the band's normal comfort zone mm. was uh, Damnation Flame, the first single. So sure. I had uh, early on in 2021, I wrote like um, wrote like a little intro, which was, you know, kind of amaranthish and, you know, not so different. Elise came over maybe half a year later when we started to work or maybe even one year later when we started to, to work more for real on the songs. And, and uh, she started to sing these, you know, really dramatic vocal lines, very theatrical. And I had to kind of back that up with some symphonic stuff. 
So uh, as the song was coming out more and more symphonic, I really like to write symphonic music. I do it a lot, you know, for other bands, other projects, for, you know, just for my own entertainment. And I started mm. a lot of composition. So for me, this is second nature. But uh, we kind of, or I kind of told myself early on with the band to give it a clear profile that it shouldn't be any symphonic right. elements. Because it's not a symphonic metal band, but it's now album number seven. We can test it and see how does it fit within, you know, the Amaran style if we make something much more dramatic and th theatrical. And we can make a, you know, kick-ass vampire video to go with it and everybody will be like, you know, totally surprised what's going on here. This is not what we expected. So I think that's good also. Like uh, Amaranth is it's a, key, a band that is kind of easy to define in your head. Mm. even if it's not easy to put a label on it. Sure. So you kind of know what to expect. It's going to be this up-tempo, dancey kind of happy metal. And then we release something like Damnation Flame, which is kind of in some ways the opposite to it. So uh, that was with, uh, outside of the band's comfort zone. And people were a little bit, you know, taken aback by it. But it's, it's already kind of, uh, you know, after six, seven months playing it live a bunch of times, it already feels like, like a classic in the set. Well, what I find interesting about... Um... That song, but also, for instance, uh, Breaking the Waves, there's some uh, uh, symphonic stuff in there. What I find interesting, uh, as a band, you've always been somewhat uh, concise songwriters. You don't linger uh, in songs for 10 minutes or, or something. So it, it still fits within the Amaranth structure, if that makes sense, the, the symphonic elements. They don't go on too long. Was that difficult to figure out how to balance uh, those symphonic elements? um both yes and no because in terms of how it fit in it fit in really naturally mm. and there wasn't too much tinkering with making the you know symphonic sounds um, work within the amaranth context but obviously as soon as you start to go more symphonic it kind of lends itself to uh, to stray a little bit and you sure. know go on for a little bit longer by the very nature of the the music itself and i think that quite early on when working on damnation flame or breaking the waves i told myself that okay okay here comes this big uh, like C part where there's more orchestra and mm. some growls and whatever. But let's keep it to that. Let's not have it drag out for two, three more minutes. Because it's just the way that Amon songs operate. Like in other for other bands, I love to write uh, you know 14 minute songs, drag it out a lot, and you know uh, develop the themes and all these things. But Amon songs, it's kind of like the concept is telling you that it needs to be short and sweet. It needs to contain a lot of parts, be kind of very energetic and very overwhelming because that's kind of what the concept is. Mm. Now, thematically then, because what I find interesting, well, I wrote a bunch of lyrics down for and we don't have to get into all of them, but uh, kind of the, the general or, or so, one of the general sentiments is kind of the, the idea of change and that it can be a thing for good as well. When, when did that, uh, because change is always scary, but there's also, I think, a lot of freedom in change as, as evidenced by the song Liberated kind of. But um, what, mm -hmm. what, where did the concept of change and, and uh, the nature of change, when did that pop into the ba band's mind? I think um, roughly speaking about halfway through uh, writing the lyrics of the album. So me and Elise write all the lyrics together. We were kind of, you know, comparing notes, like, where are we going with this, like, uh, lyrically? We were just looking at it for, for fun. Like, let's see, is there any kind of overarching theme here? And while it was on the looser side, then we quickly realized that, you know, all these lyrics are dealing with the nature of change. And more specifically, it's dealing with that catalyst, uh, you know, defining moment, the trigger right. that, that causes the change and also the consequences of uh, said change. So once we you know, realized that we had started down that path. That's also around the time when the um, album title came around because it's it's a good sounding title <laughs> and it really, you know, ma matches exactly, you know, that moment that we were trying to describe. And for us, it became an interesting thing to have uh, also on the album cover to, to have the moment of change and the trigger of change, the catalyst becoming uh, an incarnation of said change. So it's almost like a dating per se, mm. in this Android figure that is on the, the album art. So we kind of dealt with that, like, how does the catalyst get involved in all these different situations? Sort of like, uh, you know, ancient Roman goddess or something like that. How does she get involved and poke around in people's lives? Right. So 
that essentially became became the heart and the core of the thematics on the album. Is is there maybe this is too personal and you, you can answer it any way you like, but has there been a moment or in your life that that had a big change that were, uh, for which there was a catalyst for something? I don't know. I didn't word that right. I think. Yeah, I mean for yeah, I mean for example, like uh, like meeting uh, Elise back in the day. It's like 18, 19 years ago. And uh, we started to talk about music already. And just a couple of months uh, later, we were working on, you know, several different projects together. And it was okay. it was not very far after, let's say one and a half years after we met, that's when we started to talk about, you know, doing doing an actual band together. So, I mean, as soon as we took that decision, or you can see it in two layers, like that moment that we met, we started to work together and things started to change quite quickly. And then later on, like when the band got launched, it was, I can kind of clearly define it from all the time in my life before mm. Hunger was released and all the time in my life after. Because after that, we started tour. After that, we, you know, were working on music full time. And it was also like, uh, became a more of a professional thing yeah. in terms of, you know, even personal income and, you know, all that boring stuff also. So, uh, I mean, both those moments were hugely defining to us and to me. And, well, it's obviously almost impossible to say now, but do you feel like this album can be a catalyst for something as well? I mean, it's it's definitely a, a catalyst for, for some kind of change. It might not be overly dramatic for us, but obviously we are triggering some... Uh, First of all, on the creative side, you know, some uh, some elements that we haven't worked with, uh, with before musically. It's This is also the album when we are trying to take like a rather big step up in terms of stage production. Mm. So uh, we will try now to, for the Catalyst Tour, to build more of a, um, uh, how should I say, dramatic stage where it kind of fits in with the album art and, you know, all these things. So uh, there's a lot of things that are kind of new to us. Okay. And I mean, for, for us, it's the first album since COVID. And we did a lot of thinking in COVID, like, how can we do this uh, better? Not only in terms of musicality, but how can we also tour and write music and work with music in a way that affects us, you know, in a better way? Because sometimes we work too much. You know, it's all these things. So definitely it's, um, it's a new step in a new direction in quite many ways. I have one last question because you mentioned the stage show. Now you're going on tour with uh, good friends of yours, Dragon Force, and I believe Infected Rain is also on the bill. Um, what are your expectations of that tour and, and uh, kind of what's going going to happen once you get to play all these songs live? I mean, we have a little bit of an idea since we did a, we did a similar tour in the US uh, a couple of months ago uh, together with Dragon Force, but then it was uh, two different opening bands and... Uh, so we know something about the dynamics of touring with Dragon Force, which is sure. for us a lot of fun since we know them for, you know, 15 years and finally we're on tour together. So that's going to be super fun. But obviously uh, with Infected Rain, there's a, you know, now that we're only three bands, we're also co-headlining with Dragon Force sure. instead of being special guests. So there's a lot of dynamics there that are going to be different, like longer set list for us and, uh, you know, much bigger stage production and, you know, like I said, with the addition of Infected Rain, the, the dynamics of the uh, like going to the show for the audience will be different also. So there's a, there's a lot to be excited about there, for sure. Sounds great. Olaf, may I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me? Yeah, an absolute pleasure, my friend. Thank you for taking the time and, um, and um, hope to see you on tour. <laughs>